sometime in the next few decades. Humans will leave this planet to live in another world. That means that some people in our life can be the first Martians. How about that? We're finding out a lot about how to explore Mars in our station. Over a thousand people from over 40 countries have actually participated in one crew or another. It's the grandest adventure I could possibly imagine. That is, for me, the most important reason why we should pursue the establishment of life on Mars. If we go to Mars in our time, 200 years from now, there'll be new branches of human civilization on Mars. Welcome. We are live. Hey, welcome to Red Planet Live. I am your host, Ron Craig, and today is our fifth episode. And my guest today is Professor Jim Bell. Uh, Jim Bell is Professor of Astronomy and Planetary Science in the School of Earth and Space Exploration at Arizona State University, ASU. He's a past president and member of the board of the Planetary Society. Uh, Jim uh, is what we're going <laughs> to refer to him today, is heavily involved in NASA solar system exploration missions like those of the Mars rover Spirit, Opportunity, Curiosity, and most recently, of course, is Perseverance, which is cur currently tasked with searching for signs of life on the surface of Mars. And in 2011, Professor Bell received the Carl Sagan Medal for Excellence in Public Communication from the American Astronomical Society. He has also authored a number of popular science and photography books. Uh, you might have seen a lot of those. So Pulse Quotes from Mars, Mars 3D, Moon 3D, The Space Book, The Interstellar Age, The Earth Book, and Hubble Legacy, 30 Years of images and discoveries and next month his new book discovering mars uh, which he actually co-wrote with planetary historian bill sheham will be released and available for order so what we're going to do is we're going to bring on jim and uh welcome him to the show hey ron hey, hey how's Great it going you, man. thanks for having hey. me on i really appreciate it oh man it's uh it's it's really a a pleasure a huge pleasure <laughs> and and privilege of mine to actually have you on the show it's just just amazing. So yeah, so what I'd like to do is we kind of want to jump in. So I was thinking now in terms of what you're actually involved in. So I'm going to pull up here one of my little templates just to kind of make things look cool. So in terms of looking at your mission from so I mean, you are obviously leading the mass cams at Z. I'm going to no, you have to correct me. I'm in Canada. That's so fine. if I said Z, you can you can lay into me and we say we have some we me. have some Canadians on our team and they say mass cam Z. So it's all good. It's fine. Yeah. It's funny, I practiced that like six times before you came out and said Z, 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 and that comes out Z. I mean, you know, I can't, I can't beat 40 years of uh, conditioning. No worries. <laughs> so, you know, no, welcome. And so, yeah, what I really wanted to kind of talk about today is, I mean, you have been involved in so many missions and so many things from uh, over your, the course of your career from past, present, and of course, you know, going into the future. Uh, you've also actually spoken at the Mars Society uh conferences and conventions as well in the past which is amazing and your your talks there have been actually fantastic and just to kind of do a little side uh, is that our mars virtual conference actually is coming up on october 14th to 17th uh so it's going to be a virtual conference it's actually free to join free to register so go to marssociety.org and sign up today and uh you know it's been extremely successful and we would love everybody out there to actually join us today so marssociety.org you'll see and uh, sign up. So Jim, uh, you know, I think, you know, maybe we can just jump right in. I obviously, you know, I want to be respectful of your time and you're busy. So I was thinking, so I wanted to actually showcase a, you know, if we jump right in and we take a look at, let's say mass cam, you know, in terms of that mission that's currently on, on Perseverance. Now I think mass cam, you're also on Curiosity as well, is it not? So there's a mast cam on the Curiosity rover. Uh, and that is a pair of cameras. One is wide angle, one is telephoto. And uh, Mike Malin from Malin Space Science Systems is the, the PI of that. I'm one of the deputy PIs. Uh, and that's, of course, you know, it's all 3,254 uh, that Curiosity is in landing back in 2012. Spectacular mission. You've seen hopefully some of the yeah. incredible pictures of the mountainous terrain rover's been driving around in. Um, so that's mast cam, a mast mounted camera system. Um, 
the, on Curiosity. Now, Perseverance, the, the new rover that, that just landed this year, is built from something like 90% spare parts out of Curiosity. <laughs> that's, how, that's how NASA fitted into the cost box to get a second rover uh, in this, uh, in, you know, in, in, a, in a decade. Um, and uh, so that means it uses a spare this, of the same mast that, has, that Curiosity uses. So when NASA asked for new cameras, uh, you know, basically said to the world, hey, pitch us, propose to us new cameras, we already knew, everybody knew what the volume constraint was. It had to, those cameras had to fit on that same mast. Uh, and, that, and, uh, and so we work with, uh, at ASU, we work very closely with our colleagues at Mainland Space Science in San Diego. And we proposed a modified version of mast cam that zooms instead of so a fixed wide angle and a fixed telephoto like, like Curiosity's mass cam, mass cam Z, mass cam Z <laughs> is a pair of matched zoom cameras. So we can have wide angle stereo all the way to telephoto stereo, just perfectly matched uh, on the same mass. So we get 100, uh, 360 degrees of azimuth rotation, plus 90, minus 90 in uh, elevation. So it's a it's an evolution of the mast cam on Curiosity, the mast cam Z on Perseverance. Well, that's amazing. You know, one thing I think that, uh, you know, when I first was looking at the 3D images that was coming back, uh, you know, I was pretty, I think a lot of people had the same kind of miss uh, <laughs> nomer in terms of there's actually something else there that are taking selfies because they, they were saying, you know, here's Perseverance doing a selfie. And, you know, and the thing is, is that because of 3D camera technology, it really looks like there's actually another instrument or another person or something there that's actually standing in the distance that's taking a picture of. Yeah. So how does that technology work? Because you I, know, I, 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 I'm, I'm with you, man. It, it baffles me a little bit. But then here's a simple experiment you can do to convince yourself of, of what's going on. You know, you know, people take selfies of themselves all the time. Right. And so you're holding your camera. Right. You, you hold it up. And you, you're like this. Your arm is out there. Yep. Right. And you take the picture. I'm doing it. And then you have, you get a picture of yourself, and you don't see the arm. Yep. You don't see your arm, right? Yeah. We yep. do exactly the same thing with uh, with Curiosity and with Perseverance. There's a camera on the end of the arm. On on Curiosity, it's called Molly. On Perseverance, it's called Watson. But it's actually the same camera system. Also, okay. another Malin Space Science System camera. That's out on the end of the arm. We put the arm out like you put your own <laughs> arm out. And you take a bunch of selfies at different angles and you cover the, your whole body basically with selfies, yeah. uh, but you don't see the arm. It's the same thing. Yeah. Now, I think the only difference that uh, now, of course, there probably could be a software or firmware update that you can do on your phone. But if your phone could actually do the both cameras at the exact same time, you could probably mimic of what's you know i mean i think people stay you know, we talk about this a lot actually on the show is that a lot of the technology that people are using today has has become come to fruition because of the uh, necessity in space your phone a lot of what's in your phone is actually driven by what actually happened in space yeah yeah it's, i mean gps right gps yep. is a bunch of satellites that are orbiting the earth they're communicating with your phone all the time uh, lots of the, you know, the, the details of the integrated circuits and the communication technology with cell phones, uh, cell towers, you know, there's so much uh, that that has been strong of our technology, of our consumer electronics technology that mm -hmm. has been so strongly influenced by the space program over the past few decades. It's amazing. Yeah. Nate. And it's actually a fairly fairly quick and rapid turnaround when you think about it. I mean, you know, it, you know, it does take time to obviously to provision that for the retail or consumer space or, you know, whether it's commercial space. But it actually it's it's amazing that because uh, I mean, uh, I think the new technology that's going on the uh, the cameras now that was actually sent to Mars, I think, is the lidar technology, uh, which is just incredible doing for that terrain mapping, which yeah, I believe is in your yeah. camera as well. <laughs> uh, it's it's not in mass cam Z, uh, but it, it yeah. has been used on on uh, other cameras, and of course we have a lot of, uh, you know, Perseverance has more cameras than any other robot sent into space, something like twenty five yeah. if you count the helicopter cameras on Ingenuity, uh, and uh, and many of them are actually not super high tech; they're almost off the shelf cameras used for the descent imaging systems and all that yep. sent as somewhat of an experiment to, you know can we use low cost cameras for a very short period of time for a very focused job in a tough environment and so uh my colleagues at jpl tested a whole bunch of these 
essentially off the shelf cameras, put them through vacuum chambers and shaking and shocking and, and a small number of them survived. And those are the ones that got to fly all the way to Mars and take those, I mean, the, the parachute movie, the descent movie down the bridle. It was like, Oh, my, it's yeah. just insane. They're really amazing stuff. Yeah. It's a, it's amazing. And, and of course these cameras, yeah, like you're saying, they're probably, they weren't designed to be rugged. So, you know, when you buy a computer nowadays, you can actually go and say, Hey Dell, I want you to get me a computer that's, you know, designed for rugged operations and manufacturing right. or, or, and, right. but of course these are cameras, you don't really hear about cameras actually being designed uh, with that mandate. So, yeah, I mean, I can understand why you had to go to the shelf and say, let's see who can be rugged. Who yeah. Can. Yeah. And, and, you know, the mass cam Z and the mass cam on curiosity have a lot of very small optics inside with very tight tolerances and alignments and everything has to work perfectly. The zoom slides along these rails that, you know, have to work perfectly. And so the vibration of a rocket launch, the shocks of the deployments that yeah. happen after launch, I mean, these are all, huge risks to to yeah. sensitive optic systems so we had to test all that tested it in vacuum tested a huge temperature swings in that we expect in space or even on mars we tested the shocks we tested the vibrations uh and uh we appear to have ta passed our tests so we're doing really i well. would say cameras are, work cameras are working great yeah. I mean, you did so. I mean, it's brilliant. I mean, it's amazing. I mean, the, the, the whole mission has been a success. I mean, ingenuity. Absolutely. Absolutely. Is, I mean, you know, which was, I think, only supposed to go a few times. I mean, <laughs> I mean, talk about, you know, uh, outstanding success. I mean, everything with, yeah. the, with the quality of the images coming uh, back from mass cam with with everything. I mean, all the cameras are just performing admirable. And some you know, and some on. samples, samples in the bag now. Right. I mean, there are one samples. atmospheric sample and two rock samples out of a total of somewhere between 20 and 40 that we're going to collect eventually over the entire uh, course of the mission. Um, and so super exciting to be drilling into these rocks and not just drilling, but coring and collecting, you know, these, uh, these little pieces of rock that are about the size of a dry erase marker and putting yep. them in these little tubes. They're inside the rover right now. We're carrying them with us until we figure out where to place them so that this next mission later this decade can come and get them and bring them to an orbiter and bring them back to the earth. So, I mean, a bunch of us are just super excited about not just seeing Mars through these robotic avatar eyes that we see Mars through right now, that's all we can do, but we can actually, mm -hmm. we'll actually be able to see those rocks, those soils, you know, with our own eyes in the lab, uh, maybe within a decade. Boy, wouldn't that be spectacular? Will won't that be spectacular? Yeah. Oh yeah, it's going to happen for sure. I, I know I see a lot of people talking about, especially in social media, where they're saying, you know, we got to get those things back sooner rather than later. But I think, you know, one thing that, uh, you know, when you're working in in the space industry and you're doing missions like this, is that patience. Your patience is tested. You know, these things don't just happen. You can't just throw a rocket up and send it to Mars tomorrow. Uh, there's there could be 20 or 30 years of actual preparation that has, has actually yeah. been in place because I think even the Curiosity Perseverance uh, rover line, if I if I remember correctly, we are talking about 20 or 30 years of of research yeah. all building upon to make that possible. It doesn't just happen overnight. It is rigorous testing, like just rigorous right. testing. Right, and both these current rovers trace their heritage to Spirit and Opportunity, uh, which were you know in the early part of the 21st century and Spirit and Opportunity traced their heritage to Mars Pathfinder and Sojourner Rover in the mid 1990s, right? And so, yes, it has been a, a long line. But but look, I don't I don't complain about it, Ron, because you know <laughs> no. people who study the Moon and Mars, we we get fast missions compared to my colleagues who have to want to go to Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, yes. Pluto, other planets out there. Uh, I mean, decades, you know of, of planning time and then you get you know one shot like europa clipper it's like so much is, yeah. is resting on that because it's taken so long uh yeah and it's happening horizons, <laughs> the new horizons probe to, probe to pluto you know taking what like nine years to get out there at that yeah. just to travel at that so incredibly high speed you know it's solar system is big space is full of space yeah uh, and uh so but but you know studying mars the moon venus near earth asteroids Close to home, uh, we're, we're pretty lucky that the travel times are relatively short.
<laughs> yeah. You know, and I think too that uh, you know, with the with the vastness of space, you know, we say that off a lot. We say you know, space is vast, but you know, I don't think we can really comprehend. I mean, when you look at both you know the visible universe, which I think what is it about forty eight uh, to fifty billion light years across, you know, that's that's a fairly decent size. I mean, <laughs> I mean, these galaxies. Yeah. It's a, it's a little bit. So it's you know people always talk about you know uh, interstellar missions and things like that. We uh, we've got a little ways to go because uh, even getting to Andromeda, uh, sorry Andromeda to get to Alpha Centauri, you know I think we're talking like four point three light years away. That's yeah. not a, that's not a big number until you yeah. start really looking at it, how many <clears throat> how many miles or kilometers that is. That's yeah. that's substantial. Yeah. So you and know yet, we're not gonna... and yet uh, and yet there's plenty of people thinking about those those kinds of missions and uh, how we can become an interstellar uh, species, uh, not just a uh, interplanetary species, you know, one step at a time, right? But, uh, but still, it's, it's great that, uh, that there are folks mm -hmm. thinking about that, the physics that would be needed, the generational starships, all that kind of mm -hmm. fun stuff. It seems science fiction-y right now, but it's also, you know, maybe something that is achievable. Maybe not well, in our everything... lives, but uh, not too I... far from that. Yeah, you know, I think everything kind of starts out in science fiction. I mean, how many, how often have we seen everything that starts out, you know, so many things that start out in science fiction that actually become science fact? I mean, if you yeah. even look at like the movies Back to the Future, there's so much that's in that movie that they were thinking about and kind of, you know, the art, the artists were visualizing. Now look at what we have today. You know, they're talking on their wrist. We can do that. I, my watch does. That. So it's amazing yeah. that it's almost I, like we're I want, setting I want a Mr. Fusion. I want a Mr. Fusion for my DeLorean. I don't have one of those yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or the flux capacitor, right? <laughs> or a DeLorean, for that matter. Yeah, so it matter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah, I'm just going to kind of go through just to see if we have any questions coming in. So, I mean, we have one. No, I don't want to get into. I, I know I mentioned before the show that we, you know, we'll try to kind of avoid some of the conspiracy. And we, you know, we'll debunk things as they come in as as needed. But you know, I had one question come in here that I just saw go past. Where, you know, what? You know, what are the chances that we actually can terraform Mars? I know that's probably not, you know, actually, that's probably within your realm. Is, yeah. Yeah. you know, I mean, I don't know if that's something we really think about that a lot, much today, terraforming. But first, let's get there. Let's worry about that later. But yeah. <laughs> what are your thoughts on that? Well, I mean, you know, we were just talking about science fiction, science fiction. Right now, the, you know, terraforming a planet is science fiction. We don't have the technology, uh, we don't have the infrastructure. Um, don't have the time you know i mean uh we are um uh, we are engaged in an experiment right now uh changing the climate of our own planet and you know e even though we're doing our best to pump a ton of co2 into the atmosphere it still takes it's taking a while right it's taking mm -hmm. the better part of a century century and a half for that to really start taking off um, you know, hopefully we can do something about it. Uh, you know, that, that's important to know that it's happening. We, we've learned a lot about uh, our own planetary climate from climates of Mars, Venus, other places in the solar system. So maybe we'll be smart yeah. enough to do something about it. But, um, you know, to, to dramatically change uh, the climate of Mars from, you know, 1% of the Earth's atmospheric pressure uh, for a planet that is 50% farther from the sun, therefore receiving much, much less sunlight, is a massive technological undertaking that we just don't really know how to do. It's even mm -hmm. arguable whether there's, you know, enough resources there to do the job. You know, people have talked about, well, if you evaporate the CO2 ice caps, maybe release that CO2 in the atmosphere. Some colleagues of mine have, have predicted that there actually isn't enough CO2 to make much of a dent mm. in it. So how do we do that? Do we have to process the regolith in some way and extract mm. oxygen, hope that there's more CO2 or water ice uh, underground than we think, uh, bring CO2 and other greenhouse gases in by crashing a comet into Mars? It's, okay, now <laughs> we're really talking about science fiction, right? I mean, so so right now it's uh, it's kind of a dream, right? Yeah. Uh, and, th and then we have to step back and say, well, hang on, should we do that? Do we have a right to do that? What if yeah. there is indigenous life of some kind on Mars? We don't know that there isn't. Um, <clears throat> that used to be science fiction to even think about there being, yeah. you know, actual life, you know, as we know it on Mars. Uh, but what, what the rovers and orbiters and other missions of the past 50 years have shown is that 
it, there are habitable environments on Mars even today. And there were many more habitable environments on Mars a long time ago, early in the history of the planet. So it's yeah. not crazy to think about subterranean, sub-Aryan life on Mars. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, maybe simple, single-celled, microbial, you know, who knows? Um, and that's partly why we explore that that planet, partly why we want to bring samples back, because it's the, the clues, the indicators of that past life are likely to be, if it was there, are, are likely to be very subtle. Even if there's life there today, the indicators are likely to be extremely subtle, hard to find, and maybe not possible to find uh, in place with the technology that we can send on these rovers and landers. So we have to bring the samples back and take them through the most sophisticated laboratories on our planet and have 19 different groups try to validate uh, the results because, uh, you know, uh, of course, uh, one of Carl Sagan's favorite things to say was that, uh, you know, extraordinary, uh, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence Right. Yep. And so yep. if, if we do think there's evidence for life in some of these samples, uh, that has got to be tested by many, many different independent groups uh, before we'd be able yep. to say, yay, verily, we've made a historic discovery. Yeah. I mean, one thing that uh, uh, to bring up Carl Sagan, who is, I think, all of our <laughs> we all look to him, obviously, as the, the father of, you know, a lot of what we do. But, you know, one thing he also did mention in one of his uh, comments was that if there is life on Mars, even if it's microbial, he actually felt that we shouldn't go there and actually try to inhabit it from from if I remember correctly from some of his statements. So, you know, so I think we might uh, I, I'm going to, you know, I very rarely ever disagree with Carl Sagan. But <laughs> for me personally, I don't feel that. Uh, you know, I think we yeah. can coexist. You know, I think we can coexist uh, ethically, and you know, but yeah, I, I'm sure there. I don't know what your opinion is on that one, but yeah, I, I, I waffle back and forth between being optimistic and pessimistic about our species, depending on what's going on in the news. Yeah. Uh, but um, you know, and and you may be right. Uh, however, I think uh, I, I would, and many of my colleagues would really like us to do the best possible job of searching for and potentially characterizing any evidence for indigenous life on Mars before we go and contaminate the place. Yeah. Right? Just by being there, we will contaminate. We've already contaminated the planet with the Soviet landers and others, U.S. landers. You know, nothing is completely clean. Right? No. We do the best we can, but there's always, you know, some very small residual of the biota of Earth that make the trip. And uh, and so, in a sense, we we have already contaminated the planet. But locally, uh, once yeah. people start being there in larger numbers, traveling around, doing field work, uh, visiting some of the spectacular natural wonders as tourists, whatever, yeah. uh, then the the human imprint, uh, the Earth biology imprint, is going to be all over the place. Um, yeah. And if we if we ever really want to know if, if it life independently arose on mars as opposed to was seeded from the earth or vice versa uh, yep. then we've got to do the best job we can of, of characterizing that environment and doing that search before yep. this vanguard of of human and, and terrestrial hmm. biology uh, descends upon the red planet yeah and i think there's got to be some way that we that we find uh, that we can do this because you know i mean if we if we were really stern and strict on that that if there's life on a planet we can never go there then that basically means that we can never leave we can never go to any other planet because any planet i think that is sustainable to us let's say mostly let's say 80 percent of the, i don't think any planet will ever be you know we were born here we were built here so, you know, there's no planet that we can go to that. I think, you know, it's kind of interesting. We see science fiction, we see Star Trek, we see people beaming down to planets and walking around without suits. In reality, that will probably never, ever happen because we're never going to find a planet that is perfectly matched to our species. So, I never say never, Ron. I never say never. I mean, yeah, okay, but most likely. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, just the, the sheer numbers of planets, uh, you know, tens yeah. of millions of Earth-like planets in, our, in the Milky Way galaxy alone. Uh, some of them probably shirt sleeve environment for us. I mean, the, the problem though is that they're probably they're so vastly far apart that yeah. the, the travel times to get to them. But you know, to 
I agree with your point. You know, if 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 we did adopt that philosophy, then we could search, we could explore, and search. But then, if we found some evidence for life, we'd have to leave. Yeah, uh, which yeah. look uh, but not touch would be very hard to do, <laughs> right? I mean, that you know, once that Pandora's box is open. Uh, okay, uh, so closed. we have a lot of questions coming in. So uh, I'll, uh, I'll just do a couple now. I, so we have actually, so Roger Nelson coming in. So if anything feels like it's getting into a political stance, <laughs> feel free to say, you know, uh, no comment. But obviously, when you bring up other companies and what they're doing, there could be some, you know, but, you know, obviously, we have, you know, Roger Nelson here saying, you know, do you agree with SpaceX's goal uh, to make humans into play via a private exploration program? I think that's a fairly safe one. <laughs> I, I agree with the concept of making humanity a multi-planet species. It means we're out there exploring. It means we're doing science. It means we're probably being tourists as well. Um, you know, it, it means that there's, you know, economic activity of planet Earth is is spreading out into the entire solar system. So uh, I do, I do agree. I don't know if SpaceX has the right way to do it or not, but I think uh, Elon Musk's heart is in the right place, in my opinion. Uh, I and uh, I know a bunch of folks at that company who are working hard to try to, to get that vision uh, realized. Um, you know, can we do it well? Can we avoid the mistakes in human expansion that we have repeatedly made on our own planet? The the damage and carnage that we've caused to each other. Uh, yeah. Gosh, I hope we can avoid and learn yeah. from that. Again, yeah. I go through moments of optimism and moments of pessimism, yeah. uh, depending on what's going on in the news. Uh, but ultimately, I, I am an optimist, and uh, yeah. I do believe that that's part of the future that's coming. Yeah, yeah. you know, and I think, you know, we always uh, say often that we study history so that we don't actually risk, you know, repeating some of the failures or, or travesties. But unfortunately, we seem to continue to do it. So, yeah. so we're obviously yeah. not studying history well enough in, in some cases. But, you know, I, I, I like to do better. We need to do yeah. better. Absolutely. Yeah. We can so, do yeah, I mean. We have to. You know, this is this is a kind of a, a Roddenberry view, right? That the Roddenberry yep. optimism is that we can do better. We can be a better species. We can figure out how to get along. We can figure out how to live off the sustainable resources of, of our world and, and the worlds and other worlds. Um, mm -hmm. And so, you know, I grew up on Star Trek, not uh, not Battlestar and the Expanse is a little more dark and negative, maybe more realistic. I don't know, but I, I grew up with that Roddenberry optimism, and that's uh, that's what I try to to bring to all of this as well. Yeah, I've had so many debates over my life where people talk. You know, I always say, you know, are you a Star Trek fan or a Star Wars fan? No, I like them both, but you know, in reality, Star Wars, man, that is dark. They are blowing up planets left, right, and center. I mean, that is not where, that's not a good place to be. <laughs> <laughs> There's a lot of bad going on there. Star Trek, at least, was very optimistic. They always had challenges and, you know, maybe more so than they should have. But, you know, because they're always up against other species. They have, you know, but still, Star Trek, to me, was kind of the uh, the pinnacle of, you know, what we can be. I mean, it really was a social experiment done in a virtual world. And I think that's yeah. something that I always see that we can aspire to as, as humankind to say, sure. why can't we do that? I mean, look at that. Sure. I, I could live I could live in that world <laughs> and be yeah. quite content. So. Yeah, and it's you know it's it's all in that regard. It's been super exciting just the past month or two, right? To see this dawn of space tourism, really three three different companies, um, in three different ways sending people up, regular people, uh, yeah, billionaire, okay, uh, <laughs> but but uh, you know, oh, inspiration, just. just yeah, regular people, yeah. and uh, yeah. you know, just uh, this is the future that's coming. It's taken a long time to get here, uh, and it'll still take a long time to get to the, you know, thousands of people living on other planets uh, kind of dreams of uh, of of some folks. Uh, but uh, you know, you look back at the at a hundred years ago when it was just rich people flying in these crazy contraptions called airplanes. You know. Yeah. And, uh, and the government seeded the nascent airline industry by having them deliver the mail. And they helped provide juicy contracts to obscure companies with names like United and TWA. And, yeah. uh, and they used part of their profit to improve safety, reliability, 
lower cost, uh, increase access to the atmosphere and the stratosphere for yeah. regular people. And that's the world we live in now, 100 years later. And exactly the same thing is happening right now yeah. with the government is helping to seed some, not all, but some of commercial space, right? And and yeah. and and helping to lower the costs and innovations like reusability that uh, that SpaceX and Blue are innovating on, and and you know, innovative techniques to get into uh, suborbital and orbital flight from the companies like Virgin and others. Uh, you know, it's just uh, an amazing time. And give it a hundred mm, years, great. give it two hundred years, and uh, we will, you know, those people, our descendants will be living in that future of, uh, you know, Hey honey, do you want to go to the moon for the weekend? Oh, I don't know. All right. Let's go. Sure. Let's go. <laughs> yep. okay. uh, talk yeah. about a honeymoon, right? So uh, yeah. it's funny because, uh, Dr. Zubrin actually, which uh, he was on uh, my first episode. And of course he's also the, uh, the head of the, the Mars society, which produces of course the show. Uh, he, you know, he was saying that, uh, of course, in the opening intro to the show where, you know, if we start sending people to Mars in, in, you know, in the 2030s, which is, of course, his estimate when he thinks that we're actually going to start getting people there, you know, that in the next 100 years, there's going to be generations of people that are going to be living and born on yeah. Mars, where they're actually going to have their own society uh, on there. Now, of course, what that looks like in terms of the political structure, society, culture, you know, values, all that yeah. stuff are going to probably be very different than what we can probably think of today, because I think it's going to have to be uh, it's probably going to, you know, have Earth seeding it in the beginning, my, my thoughts on this, and that it's going to eventually diverge and it's going to actually become its own society, its own culture. And so that's what I would hope would happen, but I don't know. Yeah. Well, and so so will our descendants it will diverge from us, right? The lower yeah. gravity environment, higher radiation environment. You know, it's not entirely clear that we can successfully live on Mars long term. It's not clear that uh, that uh, we can have babies on Mars, right? It's just we just yep. don't know. There's, there's uh, yep. lots of unknowns, lots of work being done um, in this, on the space station and other ways to do medical research to understand the long term effects of the space environment. There'll be a bunch of uh, testing and prototyping and practice on the moon. You know, I, I firmly believe that the moon is our stepping stone to Mars. We need to learn how to go back into deep space. And we have this wonderful lifeboat right here called the moon. Uh, we're not done exploring the moon. We haven't explored the moon in person for 50, more than 50 years. Yeah. There's lots to do, great science to do there. There's uh, technology development to do there. There's, there's uh, you know, astronomy, geology, planetary science. There's tourism that's going to be on the yep. moon, but, but mostly it's about learning how to live in the space environment again and, and taking all of that experience that we rebuild with modern technology <clears throat> and, and then applying it to Mars and other destinations out there. So, you know, we, at planetary society, we talk a lot about moon to Mars. NASA talks about moon to Mars. Uh, it, it just, it, yeah, we could go directly to Mars. I know uh, Dr. Zubrin has, for a long time in advocating Mars direct missions. And, and those, those will, will work if we decide as a nation to do that. Other nations may do that. Sp SpaceX might do that. You know, who knows? Um, I, I personally prefer a kind of a methodical approach and I would love us to get that practice close to home, uh, yeah. you know, rebuild a lot of, you know, what we had uh, with uh, Apollo, but with much yeah. more modern, uh, technology so but yeah. on, honestly i i want us i want us to get out there i want us to get back i'm antsy for these new uh, commercial <laughs> missions that are going to go robotically back to the moon soon scout out places for uh, f future human settlements i'm antsy about getting the first people back to the moon uh mm -hmm. nasa astronauts maybe they're spacex maybe they'll be chinese you know who knows right but all of the above yeah. uh antsy to see that that all move forward. And of course, getting those first crews out uh, to Mars and uh, getting human boots in the red dust is, uh, yeah. I think all of us, all of us Mars nerds, right? We all share <laughs> yeah. that. Goal. We all want to see that happen. 
Yeah, you know, it's 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 amazing too. And I think one thing too, especially with what you're what you're working on with the camera technology, I think you know, with with the communication delay uh, that it takes, you know, to go and actually have you know communication or imagery coming back. You know, there is no such thing as real time communication to Mars. It's it's just not possible. And of course, but we do have near real time communication possible with the Moon. You know, I think what is it half a second each way? So like a second round trip, uh, which is basically you could for the most part is real time communication. So we have that capability. And of course, it's also close enough, I think, uh, that if there is some, you know, some sort of an emergency or something we have to intervene. Sure. Sure. You know, I mean, it is still far, we, we, we can't forget <laughs> the moon is still pretty far, but we can yeah. get there within, you know, as long as we had everything ready to go, we had a recovery mission ready, fueled up, ready to go off the launch pad, you can get there in a few days, actually, you can get to the moon, actually, I believe, in less than, less than a day, I think they've done in the past, but that was kind of a very special mission going as fast as you could possibly go right, uh, with right. that technology. But yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely benefits to, uh, but you know, we actually, one, one cool thing about, uh, and we say this a lot because what comes up uh, in a lot of conversations, it came up in actually a couple of my other shows, is people talk about, well, we have to worry about getting earth fixed. We have to worry about what's happening here on earth before we go here. But you know, totally to take that even further in, in the space context we don't have to go to the moon then go to mars we can also go to the moon and go to mars we could sure. do things in parallel because there could be like you said there's other people that may have an interest to do one or the other or both is that we yeah. can do these things in parallel we're never actually restricted to say it has to be this way you know we yeah. can be flexible we all have our preferences on how things should be and you know it's really just about being kind and you know to me about you know you know, respectful what everybody, you know, wants to do. But I think, yeah. well, I, I want to pick up on that point for a, a moment, you know, and because obviously, yeah, it, there's, it's expensive to have a space program. <laughs> it's expensive to send people out into space. It's expensive to explore. Uh, it will be expensive uh, to, to settle these other places. Uh, it will be costly in terms of dollars. It will be costly in terms of human lives. Let's not kid ourselves, right? It's dangerous. And mm -hmm. we're going out into hostile environments, starting with the explosive rockets. And then you get there and it's a vacuum and temperatures on the moon at 400 to minus 200, you know, and then you go to Mars and there's uh, you know, radiation and no atmosphere to breathe and no accessible water unless you dig, blah, 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 blah. Um, so, you know, we shouldn't kid ourselves that, that this is very expensive and so why why are we do why don't we fix our own planet what are we doing right we're never you said it earlier there's never going to be a replacement for the human uh race in in my opinion and many others besides the earth it's it's our home it's where we're built for literally right and yep. uh, so but i look at it this way right with the the, the engineering technical societal cultural solutions that we will need to live sustainably for the long term as a species on this planet okay all of that technology is also what we will need to live sustainably in space and so all the research that's being done for alternate uh, energy sources for uh sustainability in terms of resources that are needed to keep us alive air water food all the research that's being done that's being you know in the space station or thinking about people living on the moon people living on mars other destinations in the solar system all of that will come back to us on the earth yep. all of that will apply to us on the earth and help to make our planet a better place for us to live, help to make us better stewards of our planet. I really believe that. I told you before, I'm an op ridiculous optimist, okay? So there's some crazy optimism. But I, I, I think that the space program comes full circle, right? It's, it's, it's more than just GPS and Tang. Okay. It's a, it's a philosophy. It's a way of looking at ourselves as, uh, you know, lonely inhabitants of a floating island that's unique as, as far as we can tell in our solar system. Uh, maybe among, you know, the nearest stars, it could even be unique. There's probably other Earths and elsewhere in the galaxy. But for the time being, you know, this is it. This is our, this is our home. I think Carl Sagan called it our lifeboat, right? It's, yep. it's where yep. we where we make our stand as a species yep. and and 
part of the reason that we go out there and learn about these other places and learn how to live on these other places is for everybody else who's going to stay here. Mm -hmm. And uh, I really believe that. Yeah. It's almost like, you know, you have this saying, you know, it's not always in a good context, but you know, what goes around comes around. But I think, you know, when it comes to our exploration and the technology, that's the thing that we're, uh, you know, I think, you know, when it comes to these, you know, uh, NASA said it really well with with perseverance going when they actually came up with dare mighty things, you know yeah. these mighty things that we are daring to do uh, really stretch us. They stretch us technically. They stretch our imaginations. They stretch every aspect of I think of of humankind yeah. to say, I mean, yeah. the fact that we actually have, of course, you work very closely with this. We actually have robotic human technology millions of miles away on another planet, driving around. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yes. And yes. it's completely mind blowing. I mean, it's it's very hard to fathom that this is actually the reality that we live in today. Yeah, yeah. It's <laughs> it's it's as close as we can get right now to exploring Mars ourselves. In fact, you know, it is. Uh, people have debated me on this, but uh, it is human exploration. We are projecting ourselves through these avatars. It's uh, you know, I try mm -hmm. to be careful, especially talking with with school kids. Or their teachers and you know there's often it's like oh the nap the rovers discovered this or the rovers did that you know and it's like yeah but they are machines they are machines doing our bidding right we are yep. programming yep. them we are guiding them we are writing the software to help them make a limited number of decisions um, but ultimately it's it's human neurons that are driving the intelligence of these systems that we have all over the solar system and so it's people, it's teams yeah. of people that, that it takes thousands of people to do these kinds of things. And, uh, and so in a sense, robotic exploration is human exploration. Uh, and, and that's, uh, I think it's important to point that out. I'll, I'll also, you know, point out something else that I learned as a student in school that, um, you know, how, how is this tangible to us at, back here? What are, what are some of the ways? And, you know, it turned out that uh, after the Viking missions landed in the 70s, and uh, one of the things they did was, of course, they took pictures of all the landscape around them, took pictures of the atmosphere and the dust in the atmosphere and the way it reflected sunlight, made temperature measurements, and, you know, and, and noticed that um, at, when these dust storms happened and that dust was injected in the atmosphere, it got cold at the surface. And uh, it wasn't necessarily intuitive it wouldn't the dust be like a blanket that would help keep things warmer why would it get colder and this was a puzzle and one of my scientific mentors a guy named Jim Pollock who was Carl Sagan's first grad student and and others Brian Toon others worked this out and fi and figured out how dust injected into a planetary atmosphere can cool the surface and they used the same model to figure out what would happen if the US and the then USSR traded nuclear weapons ah, and injected smoke and dust into the earth's atmosphere there would be no winner nobody could win because the entire surface of the planet would be cooled to winter time sub freezing temperatures and you know mm -hmm. dramatically influence all life on our planet mm -hmm. and it's like wow hey there's something pragmatic <laughs> right <Yeah. laughs> if you can actually prove to these you know, politicians that it's an unwinnable situation. It doesn't matter if you blow up all the cities, and, hey, we win, you lose, yeah. right? And uh, and so that was a, just as a student, learning that was just a dramatic example of how you don't really know what we're going to learn about ourselves by exploring and learning about other worlds. And maybe that we should probably listen to scientists more. Of course, that actually been, has been the creed for, you know, for the last uh, couple thousand years. <laughs> but yeah, it's, it's amazing, uh, the struggles of uh, that scientists. But, you know, I think for every kind of uh, doomsday scenario or that, that maybe has been averted, there's always been a scientist that has been advising somebody that actually, you know, convinced them to say, you know, maybe we shouldn't be launching those. <laughs> so, you know, it's doing yeah. our due diligence, right? I, I encourage people to listen to their inner scientist, right? Yeah. Uh, think, think critically. Well, question things. Uh, go work it out for yourself. Uh, follow authoritative sources. You know, um, uh, make a hypothesis and test it. And if it's wrong, change it. Right? I mean, these are just hallmarks of the scientific method. That's 
that's what's got us to where we are with modern medicine, right? I mean, our, our lives are so enriched by modern medicine and, and, and modern technology because of this just this simple scientific method of way of thinking. Yeah. So, so Jim, I wanted to give you a kind of a, a opportunity. Funny, how, you know, just actually, you know, just when I was thinking of that, it's amazing the names of the missions <laughs> that have gone to Mars. Curiosity, perseverance, opportunity. <laughs> it's like, I mean, talk about picking the right words mm -hmm. for the job at hand. I mean, it's just amazing how they're all inspirational. They're always inspirational uh, words. But anyway, I'm going off topic and tangent, but I wanted to bring that up just as I'm saying the word. It's all good. It's all good. But I want to, but I want to give you the opportunity to, because, you know, the mass cam, uh, imagery that comes back. I mean, these are extremely high resolution, extremely detailed, you know, imagery. So I wanted to give you an opportunity. Do you actually have some images that you actually have available that you'd like to share, or maybe even showcase oh, some of the sites? You, and you know, images? Yeah. So I pulled up uh, before we started. Um, let's see if I can do this here. I sh can uh, share, share. I can my... share. I can add your screen in there if you'd like. Oh, there you go. It, yeah, is, that people, my, if you're... is that my screen? That Mine, is your see, screen. See the screen yes. Oh, okay. <laughs> that is your screen. Yeah. I can't. I can't see them both. Sorry. Uh, yeah, yeah. So there's no. this great, great website. If you just if you just Google um, Mars 2020 raw images, you'll get this this URL here, and um, you can see all the data that come down from Perseverance rover from all of the cameras. Look at all these engineering cameras, science cameras, entry descent landing cameras, helicopter cameras, right? And so we can have a little fun here and just choose mass cam Z. So what happens is as soon as the data are downlinked to the earth, they come to one of NASA's deep space network antennas in Spain, Australia, or California. And then all those ones and zeros from the radio signal get relayed to the jet propulsion lab in Pasadena and then turned back into the images and they get kind of split up and they come to the science team and then they go to the web uh, in, Real time, automated. We have no control over it, uh, so everybody can see the pictures uh, as soon as as we see the pictures. So here's some recent pictures that have come down just in the last few days. We actually just started a break. Uh, the Perseverance and Curiosity teams are on what's called a conjunction break because mm -hmm. it's superior conjunction. Mars is going not exactly behind the sun, but very close to behind the sun on the other side of the solar system right now. And when Mars gets that close to the sun, it disrupts radio communication. And so um, the management just says, OK, everybody, take three weeks off. We're just going to let the rovers rest and downlink some data that they've collected earlier, or at least try to uh, with the kind of ratty radio signals. And uh, But everybody gets like a three-week uh, respite from the grueling day-to-day -day operations. So we're seeing some images that were taken more than a couple of days ago from uh from the mass cam z camera so you can go in here and you can look at uh some here, just pick one here here's one from uh sol 215 so just a couple of days ago and you can download these yourself and you can do that for all the cameras and just see what's coming in every day just day after day all these amazing images um and then we also have i wanted to showcase are you seeing my um my uh mass cam z website Yep, yep. Uh, yeah, all okay. your tabs are visible. So yeah, yeah you, okay, you great. Your yeah. screen there. Yeah. So this is uh, masscamz.asu.edu. It's at Arizona State. This is the public website for the MassCamZ investigation. So uh, we don't host the raw images here. JPL hosts those, but we do uh, host a series of uh, calibrated images, and um, we have some team favorites, right? So team members have picked their favorite images. Mm -hmm. Uh, from the first 200 uh, sols or so of the mission, some of them in stereo, some of them in uh, enhanced color, some of them in true color. This is one of, I think I entered this one. This is just a beautiful shot of this place called Kodiak that we got an early morning shot of sunlight on these just spectacular uh, layered rocks. This is part of the delta in Jezero. And this is enhanced color. This isn't what our eyes would see. We've made the reds redder and the blues bluer. Uh, but it, to me, it was just so dramatic to see these. We weren't seeing these these uh, these slopes because they were in shadow with the sun uh, in the western sky. So we had to take this picture just after sunrise with the sun coming from the east and low to illuminate these surfaces. Uh, and there's a paper coming out, uh, our first peer-reviewed 
research paper as a team coming out next week in Science Magazine, all about uh, what we're seeing in here and the implications for uh, previous uh, water flow in uh, in Jezero Crater. So check that out next week uh, in uh, in Science Magazine. So that's kind of cool. Um, yeah. And you can, but you can also, you. yeah, go ahead. Yeah, I just wanted. To, so, can you explain why? Because uh, a lot of because even even Hubble does this, and and, and everything else uh, that takes pictures typically takes these images in different color schemes. And what are the benefit of doing uh, versus true color that my eyes would see, as yeah. opposed to some false color? I mean, why do we do that? Why do we put the effort into actually altering the colors and making it so, let's say, for all yeah. better sense of word, not quite yeah. realistic. Yeah, it's a great question. Um, and, and the answer is because uh, our eyes are very limited. We see in a very small part of the spectrum, red, green, blue, right? Mm -hmm. But these digital sensors and cameras nowadays and spectrometers can see in the ultraviolet as well as the visible and, and the infrared. Uh, and different kinds of atoms and rocks and minerals reflect or emit uh, light at different colors outside of what we can see in different ways. And so we basically can use these different color parts of the spectrum that the instruments can see that our eyes can't see as fingerprinting tools. So in the case of the rover cameras, certain kinds of rocks and minerals like some iron oxides and some other kinds of volcanic iron bearing rocks will reflect light in the infrared differently than they do in the visible and different minerals will reflect differently among the, those classes of minerals. And so we have some some infrared filters, not heat infrared, but short, still reflected sunlight infrared that uh, can detect those patterns of color differences. And so we can use those to do a limited amount of, of sort of mineralogy with the cameras. It, they're cameras, they're not spectrometers, but we can, we can sort of triage the scenery around us and find interesting color variations, including ultraviolet and infrared, and then tell our colleagues on the spectrometer team, hey, why don't you go point over to that? You're going to find something interesting, hopefully. Um, so it's sort of a because we can cover so much real estate around us, but the the high resolution spectrometer instruments can only do little little points here and there. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, so that that's one reason. And you know, Hubble does the same thing. Certain kinds of uh, uh, ions and and uh, elements emit at certain colors, but not in the visible light. So you want to get pictures of hydrogen emission or calcium emission or sodium emission or whatever you pick filters that are just keying in on those specific colors yeah. so i mentioned you know we we, we put the calibrated images uh, on our uh, website we've got twenty six thousand of them there and people can take these and they've had some of the camera effects taken out uh, so they're more uniform people are making mosaics out of these and then one of my favorite places is um, our public submissions site so there's a form you can submit an image for consideration. People are making their own panoramas, making their own anaglyphs, excuse me, making their own VR movies out of what we're putting out there from Mass Cam Z and other cameras on uh, on on the rover. So that's that's pretty cool. I invite people to check that out and submit for consideration your own work. That's a, a lot of fun. And then we have a great blog that uh, team members put together lots of stories, insider information about things that we're finding, uh, cool uh, experiences that some of our students are having. Um, one of our uh, colleagues on the team is uh, an astrophysicist who's really into stereo imaging, founded a, a company in London called the London Stereoscopic Company. His name is Brian May. Can you see his picture here? Yep. And people may know it's also the same Brian May who was the lead guitarist from the rock band Queen. Uh, so we're super, super excited. Oh, wow. Brian Artin, he's, he's become an astrophysicist and interesting in stereo imaging, and he helps produce all kinds of great, um, he and his colleague uh, Claudia Manzoni help produce all kinds of great stereo views, and they have a little stereo corner blog on our website. So anyway, just a great place to poke around. You can, you can also learn lots more about um, about the cameras themselves, about the instrument. And there's that picture you showed and some tech specs, uh, the science goals that we have, mm -hmm. uh, pictures of the instrument, more details and pointers uh, on the mission uh, in terms of uh, what um, uh, 
uh, what we're doing with all the other instruments, pointers to the NASA website, the JPL website, all kinds of cool technical details about how the mass cam Zs work, including a cool animation about what's going on there inside the zoom lenses when we go from telephoto, from wide angle to telephoto, for example. So a lot of fun. I love I love our website and a lot of people enjoy the the information that we put out there. And what's that URL again? Uh, I can also askamz.asu.edu. Okay. Askamz. <laughs> edu. Okay, so, and and you can find links to all of the JPL and NASA sites there as well, uh, and learn lots about not just perseverance but curiosity and the Insight lander mission, which is continuing on Mars, and the dozens of other spacecraft all over the solar system that NASA and other space agencies are are running today. Cool. It's really just an incredible golden age of exploration of our solar system right now. Yeah. So let's talk a little bit about the evolution of, let's say, the camera technology in terms of, you know, where you started. I mean, we almost have to go, you know, maybe a little delve back into the past. Uh, you know, I mean, you've been at this for a little bit of time. <laughs> so, you know, in terms of, you know, where it started and what does that evolution look like in terms of the quality, uh, the technology, the components, you know, if maybe take us back, you know, when you yeah. first started, what was it, what did it look like then versus to what we are, I mean, we see what we're getting back now and it's just, yeah. you got to be kidding yeah. me. That's being sent across interest, you know, interstellar space. Yeah, at least inter <laughs> interplanetary space, at least. Yeah, I, I just uh, right. caught myself uh, there. Yeah, yeah. It's all right. It's all good. Uh, well, you know, when I was a, when I was a kid and the Viking landers landed, the, the pictures, the camera was just a couple of pixels and it was sending down these vertical strips one strip at a time. It was like watching paint drip down the wall. It was incredibly slow. And, uh, and now, of course, we have these megapixel digital cameras. Uh, and, uh, you know, NASA and other space technology lags behind commercial technology. And, and for good reason, because, you know, you, you can't just take your phone and put it on a rocket and expect it to work in a, in a super harsh radiation temperature, near vacuum, shock and vibe environment of space, right? So the technology has to be ruggedized, like you said before. It has to be tested out in a often high radiation environment, missions that go to Jupiter and Europa, super high radiation compared to the Earth's environment. Um, so, the, you know, these are dangerous places and places where commercial electronics just won't work right. Um, so it, 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 it lags and NASA, uh, especially also lags commercial technology just because of a fundamental conservatism that the agency has, which is uh, you know appropriate in many circumstances. They're spending lots of taxpayer dollars to do this, and we want to guarantee that these these things will work, right? And so you can't just say, okay, now I'm going to put a 40 megapixel camera on a on a spacecraft, even though one's never flown to space before, and I don't know if it'll fly in space. I don't know if it'll work right can't do that. It's too risky. It's too much of a risk to take with, uh, you know, Congress and the taxpayers uh, money. And so it tend, you tend to make incremental improvements like mass cam Z was an incremental improvement over mass cam on curiosity. We added that zoom capability, tweaked the filters a little bit, improved the software a little bit, right? But incremental mm -hmm. um, taking, taking big leaps is hard. It's hard to do. Uh, because, you know, you need uh, a lot of testing to prove that it'll work if your risk posture is uh, very intolerant to risk. Now, there's lots of entrepreneurial companies out there, small small space startups and others that are willing to take more risk, and they're making more leaps, like uh, landing your first stage booster on a crazy <laughs> floating platform. I mean, who, yep. the, who the heck is going to do that, right? Well, yep. a small entrepreneurial a company that is spending some of its own money, right, mm -hmm. to, to do that, not all, but some of its own money to do that. And, uh, you know, they're willing to take more risks. So it's it's really a exciting time to see lots of commercial space startups, especially entrepreneurial ones, take these risks. And, you know, these, these landers, mm -hmm. they're going to go to the moon soon in the next few years that, you know, they're going to be riskier, higher tech, riskier with a greater potential for reward. Uh, but the, the big missions like Perseverance, Curiosity, Europa Clipper, Galileo, Voyager, Cassini, before that, you know, um, 
generally much more conservative and careful and cautious with these larger expenses involved. Yeah, it almost seems to be almost uh, yeah, relative to the distance that you're setting. I think you know if you're going to you know if you're going to go to low, low Earth orbit, you know you could probably take a little bit more risk, uh, just yeah. because you're not going as far. But if you're going to send yeah. something you know over to let's say Europa, which is going to take I think what is it a nine year trip, yeah. uh, at least uh, you know so you Seven can't so, just, yeah. yeah yeah you yeah. just can't <laughs> that's a that's a long ways to go to say we shouldn't have sent the camera, yeah. <laughs> and you know uh, a billion dollars later. You know, it's uh, so I, I, it definitely makes sense that, you know, I mean, and I think that, you know, to get back to your point about the moon, that I think that's one of the advantages of going to the moon first is because you can test your your concepts, you can test your processes, you can test your theories, uh, your technology and everything else that we're doing, even from the human perspective. And actually, that may save lives uh, yeah. that if we're going to just send somebody to Mars and, you know, it, I think it all depends on, you know, how much risk you are willing to take. And I, I'm sure there are going to be a lot of people out there that would say, I'll go to Mars tomorrow. I will take that risk. You will find people that will probably put their hand up and are ready to go. Yeah. And other people might be a little bit more conservative. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's it's what you choose, right? And it's, yeah. Uh, no, look, I, I, I would love to go, but I'll tell you what, I want to come back, man. <laughs> I, I want to come back. Earth is my favorite planet. I've lived here most of my life. Most of my friends <laughs> are from here. So, I, but I totally would love to take that trip someday. Yeah. So I know we're getting close to the uh, time. So what I want to do is give you the opportunity. You have uh, authored a fair number of books, uh, you know, some amazing books. And you actually have a book coming out uh, recently. Now, actually, I'm pretty sure that uh, when we were talking initially, uh, it was supposed to come out, I think, next month. But I believe you can order it today. It's uh, Yeah, but it won't be officially released until, I, I want to say, October 12th or something. Okay. So a couple of weeks. Okay. Uh, so I'm just going to bring... You found it. It's called Discovering Mars. Uh, history of observation and exploration of the red planet. It's uh, my uh, colleague uh, Bill Sheehan is the lead author, and I'm the I'm his co-author. Uh, Bill is an a historian, also a psychologist. Uh, he's written a number of books on his own about the whole history of Mars and canals and seeing what we want to see and the a lot of the characters involved in the early history of Mars exploration. And he wrote a book back in the '90s. Uh, called the planet Mars. And I remember reading that when I was a student and getting an awful lot of information out of that is history of the early telescopic days of, of Mars exploration. And, um, and he wanted to, he, that was with the University of Arizona Press. Uh, this book is with the University of Arizona Press. And I, I think they must have approached him or he approached them about updating the book. And, uh, you know, he's, he's like, well, you know, there's been this whole history of space exploration of Mars now. Uh, more than 50 years. Uh, in fact, this year is the 50th uh, anniversary of the Mariner 9 uh, mission to uh, the first uh, uh, mission to orbit Mars. Uh, that's in November. Um, and so he reached out to me and we talked and uh, we agreed to expand his original book to include an updated version of the entire history of telescopic exploration of Mars and the entire history of spacecraft exploration of Mars up to the missions that have have uh, landed this year. And we think it's the first time that anyone's tried to capture that entire history of Mars exploration from naked eye, telescopic, through spacecraft in, in one place. It's 700-something pages of one place. Uh, and we have some, some nice illustrations and all that. Um, but uh, it was just a, an enormous amount of fun to work with Bill. Uh, he's a fount of knowledge of the history of Mars and, mm -hmm. uh, and a lot of work to try to summarize. Uh, you know, I learned a whole bunch of stuff I hadn't known about uh, many of the Soviet missions, for example, and so many attempts that they made to get to Mars, to beat uh, the U.S. to Mars uh, in the 60s. Um, and uh, just, uh, you know, comes out next month and uh, it's a tome. Uh, you look that thick, uh, uh, but for, for again, Mars nerds like us, uh, ho hopefully yep. it'll be a good read and, uh, we've gotten some good, uh, good reviews on it, uh, already. Uh, Kim Stanley Robinson wrote the forward for us, uh, yeah. which is just great. I mean, what a, what a treat, uh, that was to have, uh, you know, that, that uh, visionary author, uh, take a look at our work and judge it. Well, <laughs> it was great. Yeah. No, that's amazing. Well, it's like uh, but, an encyclopedia. Yeah, 
You wrote yeah, an encyclopedia, so, really. <laughs> uh, we got uh, there's some appendices in there about timekeeping on Mars. Emily Emily Lakdawalla, who used to work for Planetary Society, okay. wrote a wonderful piece about Mars timekeeping as an appendix. Uh, how does you know how do we keep time on Mars? How do we reckon the seasons on Mars? Um, uh, Casey Dreyer from the Planetary Society wrote a wonderful piece about the cost of Mars missions historically over time. You know he did that for Apollo as well, and that was hugely popular on the web. He's done that for all of uh, all the Mars missions as well, trying to estimate, you know, what they have cost. And it's been a tiny fraction of the NASA budget, actually, for for all of these missions that have gone something like 47 missions internationally, something like 18 to 20 attempts to land on the surface uh, going back to 1960 uh, with uh, now 10, 10 successful landings, the Chinese uh, Tianwen-1 uh, uh, mission and uh, lander and rover uh, were the 10th successful mission to land. Yeah, we're getting pretty first, good at it now. <laughs> of course, the first, the Chinese were the first uh, non-NASA mission to successfully yeah. land on Mars. And the Europeans will try uh, with their launch uh, next year again. Yeah. Well, I love the actually the new the new uh, process where they're actually doing it with the sky crane. I mean, I think that's uh, that's a winner because I think you know one of the one of the previous missions, of course, they were using the uh, the airbags, uh, which is you know I'm just thinking if I was actually on the planet uh, as a as an indigenous native <laughs> and seeing this you know airbag coming down, it's like you know okay, but it worked. It it worked beautifully. What a I mean, it did, what a yeah, and, yeah, yeah. But now, I mean, when you think about the whole you know the 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 sky crane and everything dropping the rover on the planet, I mean, that is right out of the, out of the scenes of sci-fi movie you know yeah. something coming down and dropping something and and and, and leaving you know it didn't go far but it left <laughs> i mean you sure you weren't shooting a hollywood movie because that's pretty I know. much what, what it looked i know like. and, and we have the movies to prove that we did it you know and that's yeah. that's incredible so okay so i want to give you an opportunity then uh, uh as we wrap up to kind of talk about you know what's in store for for Jim Bell and, and ASU and, and future missions coming up with what, what do we, what's coming down the road that you actually can share with us that maybe, you know, people might not know. Well, of course, you know, a lot of us in the Mars community have, have our eyes on Mars sample return on the, on getting those samples that are being collected right now by Perseverance and the Mars 2020 team, uh, getting them back to the earth, doing, completing our mission really, with that robust, detailed, uh, authoritative assessment of the chemistry, the mineralogy, the atmospheric composition, and the biologic potential. Mm -hmm. you know? and, uh, and so that involves several future missions in collaboration with the European Space Agency. All the details are not worked out. The budgets are not approved, right? Uh, so this is going to be a long-term program, but NASA and ESA are collaborating on this, on a, a lander and a rover that would go get those samples potentially. Uh, and that lander carries its own little rocket that the samples get put into, and the rocket launches and goes into Mars orbit, and there's an orbiter waiting uh, to collect that those samples, uh, that sample container, and bring it back to the Earth, maybe by 2031 or thereabouts. Yeah. Uh, it's possible that that could happen. Um, but so that's really that's really Mars 2020 mission. The mission of Perseverance isn't isn't done until we bring nope. those samples back. Um, so that's a big step. Yeah, I mentioned the Europeans are sending a um, their own rover, the Rosalind Franklin rover. Uh, as part of their ExoMars lander package uh, with the uh, with the Russians, and uh, they're going to launch next year. Um, you know, we've got all these missions still operating: the Indian Space Agency operating in orbiter, the UAE operating in orbiter with a variety of instruments, the Europeans with orbiters there, NASA with the MRO, and the venerable Mars Odyssey still doing its job. Uh, with science inst instrumentation and communications relay, the MAVEN orbiter. Gosh, who am I missing? Uh, the InSight lander is still on the surface, yep. right? So, so continuing the operations and this, the exploration of the planet with the, with the assets that are there. Um, so, I, you know, and then I, I, I don't know if, if uh, humans to Mars is going to happen in the 2030s. It seems like... And I think Bob Zubrin would agree, Mars, humans to Mars has always been 20 years away, you know, yeah. no matter when we think about it, right? And, uh, but, you know, the, the pieces of the puzzle are coming together and additional 
additional capabilities coming from the outside, right? Mm -hmm. Of course, the Chinese interested uh, and SpaceX interested. Mm -hmm. And both independent agencies, companies capable uh, potentially of doing that. So it's not just NASA in this game anymore. Although, of course, you know, NASA is my favorite space agency. <laughs> I'll confess that. No, um, no but, problem. Uh, Mine too. <laughs> certainly would love to uh, love to see NASA take the leadership on that and and maybe make it an international effort. Let's collaborate. Let's go as a planet and uh, and explore this new world. Well, I think cooperation. I mean, I think you know. I think even uh, you know because the Mars Society put out a uh, a tweet in a, a, a not long ago that uh, Elon Musk himself retweeted where they talked about you know that this has to be done in a cooperation. You know, it has to be cooperative for this to really happen because I think there's certain things that just can't happen. You know, SpaceX. You know, let's say they decide we want to go to Mars tomorrow, but there's gonna there could be uh, the need for certain technologies that they just don't actually have the capability to put there. Like you know, people talk about needing a nuclear reactor. Uh, on the surface of Mars, but commercial companies can't typically get a nuclear reactor and it's just move it there. So you, it's yeah, so you, yeah, <laughs> so you kind of have to have that cooperative. You need to have somebody overseeing yeah. it and actually keep in. You know, we do better together. You know, we we always will perform better together. I mean, I'm, 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 I'm a fan. You know, competition does work. I think cooperation can work better. You know, but yeah. uh, both models work, right? Yeah. We we got to the moon and Apollo because of competition. Yep. And that, you know, of course, you know, we won that space race and it completely revolutionized our scientific knowledge of the Earth Moon system. And, you know, the expectation is that we will, you know, vault to new levels in our knowledge of Mars by exploring the place with people as well. No, that's amazing. No, I mean, so I, I just want to thank you again. You know, I think, you know, obviously I want to be respectful of your time and, uh, you know, I really appreciate you coming on and you really sharing your thoughts about uh, Mars and the missions and everything you've worked on. And, you know, of course, there's so much more excitement in the future. And I think we're at a time now where, you know, if you look at the Apollo era, now, of course, that's a bit maybe before I was able to, <laughs> I wasn't alive then, but, you know, the excitement and everything that was going on then, you know, I mean, it, it really rocked the planet you know, everybody was talking about. It. And I think we're getting to a point now in the space program with everything with the commercial programs. And, you know, there's a launch like, I mean, space launches weren't that, it were far and few between. Now there's a space launch every week. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes <laughs> multiple, multiple yeah. times per week. Yeah. Yeah. So it's just just incredible. So I want to thank you. I mean, I really appreciate you coming on. And uh, obviously, you know, uh, hopefully again, we can have you on again in the future and maybe talk about some other things. You actually said something that really was interesting to me is that you actually do a lot of uh, you do some uh, education with children. And uh, so that's something that I actually want to look at doing a program or an episode in the near future where we actually yeah. go and maybe get some kids on and actually do something fun uh, in that regard. So that'd be cool. Maybe we can invite you back for that. Oh, yeah. Space is a, just a great way to reach kids and STEM. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it, they're just naturally curious. They're naturally scientists and uh, and excited, just like we are as grownups, about rockets and space travel yeah. <laughs> and planets and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, Jim, thank you very much for your time. I really appreciate it. And uh, uh, everybody else who came in, I, I love the questions that came in. I really appreciate it uh, for the audience, for the guest. Uh, thanks to the Mars Society for producing the show. And uh, as I mentioned before, our virtual conference is coming up from October 14th to 17th. So make sure that you get to the MarsSociety.org and you register. We want to see, I mean, it's a beautiful event. You're going to love it. So we want to see you there and uh, I will bid you adieu. <laughs> Thank you, Ron. Thanks for having okay. me. I appreciate it. Thanks, Jim. Take Thank you very much. much. Okay, Take bye, care. everyone. Sometime in the next few decades, humans will leave this planet to live in another world. That means that some people in our life can be the first Martians. How about that? We're finding out a lot about how to explore Mars in our station. Over a thousand people from over 40 countries have actually participated in one crew or another. It's the grandest adventure I could possibly imagine. And that is, for me, the most important reason why we should pursue the establishment of life on Mars. If we go to Mars in our time, 200 years from now, there'll be new branches of human civilization on Mars.